Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, in this business, there are so many icons that start off somewhere incredibly unique and, and one of a kind that you just have to see it to believe it. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of entertainment industry professionals. We pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and in a conversational fashion. And, you know, if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that you do, because, quite frankly, you're listening right now. You are. You really are. And if you do, you're doing a good thing. But you can do another good thing. Subscribe to the podcast. Hit that subscribe button. Give us the old five-star rating. Basically, on all platforms that you get your podcasts, we're at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google. It's pretty much all good. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seat YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we would absolutely appreciate it. Also, don't hesitate to check us out on the social media. I think that's what the kids are calling it these days anyway. But we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we're on Instagram at Where Else Would We Be? We're at In The Seats. For all sorts of fun updates, and finally, and I do dare say most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of the moving image at large, really. Because if, you know, film, television, film festivals, because you know what, if we love to watch it and write about it and talk about it, guess what, we love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please, pay us a visit. On this episode, boy, we got a fun one. This is a a film that is opening uh, in select theaters now with our friends to the south in various markets. I think it's New York and L.A. and it's going to roll out in the weeks to come. But it is uh, is the story of a, well, it's a bit of the story of a cinematic icon, but uh, also one of his earlier works. It's, uh, we look at the, the life of a young Orson Welles and... We see it in Voodoo Macbeth, which is what, which was one of his uh, very first uh, directorial jobs, if not his debut, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but it's a, it's a lovely, lovely film. That it is set in 1936 Harlem, where the first all-black cast production of Macbeth is struggling to make it to opening night amid the downward spiral of their young and untested director. You guessed it, Mr. Orson Welles himself. Now, there's something else that's really unique about this project, not just because it is sort of recapping a a fascinating piece of uh, theater and cinema lore. Orson was apparently, this is one of the projects that he was apparently the most proud of up until his dying day, but with this film, we have a unique situation because there are uh, 11 directors and 8 writers for this film. Now, on paper, I know what you're thinking, that should be a mess, but guess what? It actually works, and it works incredibly, incredibly well to make a really interesting and compelling piece of cinema, and we had the unique pleasure of sitting down with the two stars of the film, Miss uh, Inger Tudor, who plays Rose McClendon, uh, who uh, works behind the scenes and on stage, obviously, at the Black Theater Troupe in Harlem, but also Mr. Jewell... Wilson Bridges, who has the indomitable task of playing Orson Welles himself. And we sit down with the two of them to talk about making the film, sort of the legacy therein, and so very much more for a fantastic conversation, which I certainly hope you enjoy. But, you know, obviously go check out Voodoo Macbeth in New York and L.A. today. It's open right now. Uh, It'll be in uh, other cities in the coming weeks. But first, enjoy our talk with Inger and Jewel, because between you and me... I think it's a darn good one, just like this movie, so enjoy. Now, I mean, obviously, officially, just to kick it off, Inger, Jewel, just thank you so much for the time today, and congratulations on the film. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. We're just excited to have people see it. Now, I mean, I guess my first question, I mean, it's for both of you, but we'll start with you, Inger. Just walk me through getting this initial pitch, because, I mean, in reading that this is a film with multiple directors and multiple producers and a huge cast, on paper, this should be a mess, but it's not. It works. <laughs> like, walk me through sort of the initial pitch for you to be involved on your end. Well, I, I have a slightly different story. I 
had the uh, privilege of doing one of the table reads of an early draft. Okay. And, and, you know, John Watson, who's the head of the program at USC had said, oh, we, you know, we're doing this table read. It'd be great if you could come in and read this part. And I'm like, sure, you know, whatever. I didn't really know anything about it. And I get there and I start reading and I'm like, wait a minute, this is based on a true story. How have I never heard of Rose McClendon? How have I never heard of this federal theater? You mean the government used to fund theater? What, what is happening? Um, So that was sort of the pitch for me. And then I, I did have to audition for it, but just the idea of this project, this play and this woman were so exciting to me. I I knew I really wanted to be a part of the, um, the film. Fantastic. Now, I mean, Jewel, for you, like, I'm curious because, I mean, obviously you have an extensive theater background, but this is one of your first sort of on-screen credits and you're playing Orson Welles, for God's sake. Uh, That must be a little bit daunting (laughs) to sort of read that. You know, uh, I was just so excited. And the nice thing about how this went down was from the moment of casting to our first day of shooting, it was a pretty fast turnaround. So I didn't have really time to get in my head about taking on and personifying this very well-known person. Instead, I just, I just had to get to work and do it. And it it, it helped. It helped take the pressure off. And I just got to play as a result. But it was the same way for me as Inger. Um, I think for every actor who got to see the description of this film and to look at the breakdowns, it's very apparent as an actor, when you encounter a story that just, you know, has the potential just to be such gold and to be excited to be a part of something like this. I think we all knew even before that first table read for me that we really had something uh, special on our hands and it just has really proven it every step of the way. Now, I mean, I'm curious for both of you because just in watching the film, it felt very much just like it came off like a stage production. And I mean, I'm kind of curious is there a big transition between preparing for the stage and preparing for the screen or is it is there or is it very similar i think in the way you approach uh the role you're playing the person you're portraying i don't think there's a difference um i think where the difference comes in is um just you're having to be aware of where the camera is and at at the same, it's a combination of being aware of where it is so that you are placed appropriately and at the same time forgetting that it's there so that you can just live. Um, Because that is one of the advantages, of course, with theater is you you just kind of live on stage and you don't have to worry about things getting in your face and boom mics and all the other stuff. But with a film, those things are very important so that people can hear you, so they can see what's going on. But at the same time, you have to have enough of a life of the person you're portraying that you can just live in that moment regardless of what's around you. Also, I think with uh, with theater, the nice thing is you get to tell the story from beginning to end chronologically. Um, many ways you can allow that story to take a hold of you and in just one moment builds upon the other. Whereas with film, because most of the time things are shot out of sequence, just based upon uh, you know where you have your location and what things kind of line up, you have to do that work for yourself as an actor. You can't rely upon building on the beat that came before. Mm. And and uh, so I think that is one of the more challenging aspects uh, from with when it comes to film. But for me, um, it was such a wonderful, mel- this film was such a wonderful melding of our experiences, both on stage and with film. And we got to bring both of those. I just thought it was like, for me as a theater actor, it was the perfect first feature for me to bite my teeth into because I got to bring all of my experience from one area and expand it in a different medium. I mean, you know, and there's really an interesting sense of historical weight here as well, because I mean, obviously this is based on a true story, but on one end, there is the social dynamic of Mm -hmm. just having these actors on stage and being representative and having all that stuff going on. But at the same time, there is very much a creative and artistic weight of the fact that this actually happened that you have to carry as well. I mean, is that something that you think about or is that something you have to sort of push out of your head as you're preparing for for something like this? Well, I think think you do think of it in terms of how it affects the person you're playing. Like, I definitely think that for, you know, Rose, um, knowing that this is the first 
all black production of Macbeth in Harlem that she gets to put this on that it's also during the time period because it is the 1930s that this is also going to employ so many African Americans in the Harlem community and so there there's all of that historical weight that you know, the character also has to be thinking about in terms of why this is so important, not just for me as an actress wanting to play Lady M, but for me as a theater leader, a theater maker in my community, how is this helping my community during the depression? I think when you look at adaptations of true uh, stories, I think it is impossible to tell any kind of biopic and be completely accurate to history. One of the reasons why is because history is filled with a lot of downtime. You know, all of those moments where things are happening, life is filled with things where it's just kind of like mundane. You're, you're going to rehearsal, things are moving forward. I find as an actor, the more you cannot focus on the pressure of being um, fully, fully, um, completely 100% percent accurate and instead focus on the truth focus on the story focus on the character I just kept my eye on the spirit of Orson and I kept an eye on the cast and crew and how we can all collaborate with and trusting that if you keep the focus on those elements everything will turn out as it's supposed to well and it really did feel like we were in the theater and I mean mm -hmm. everything that was going on in the world outside we got some glimpses of it, but I mean, there were intimations of it. I mean, I particularly love the scene between the two of you where, Julie, you were thinking about taking over a role in Ingrid. You just basically just shoot him a look and be like, really? Really? You're going to do that? Really? Yes. How important was it for both of you to, to be making a statement, but not sort of be sort of hammering audiences over the head with sort of the issue of it? Well, you know, uh, to that end, there have been lots of conversations uh, before we got on set with our directors, with, uh, with the writers, uh, considering too, there's a lot of like sensitive material, uh, sensitive subject matters that we really um, face head on. And so for us, we felt so empowered and so confident in the story we were telling before we even got on set because of that collaborative atmosphere and everything that we were talking about just as actors, the writers and directors were talking about for months and months and months and months and months. So all of these things had been hashed out as a group and everything that is included is, is there's no... Um, there's no throwaway. Everything is very um, particular. So for us, uh, we, we felt very empowered to take on these subject matters and be able to describe them. And while our story is very true to the time period, there, were some, there are some elements in the story that we bring from like, oh, this actually happened on the tour of of uh, Voodoo Macbeth, or like this happened, this happened a little differently in the time frame in order to be able to um, truncate it and be able to get everything in that we needed. Yes, because everything, um, pretty much everything that happened to the characters did happen to them. It may not have happened to them during the rehearsal of, right, right. of Voodoo Macbeth. And I just also, I mean, to, to your question, I think the way it's written, the, the statement is just there in, in the way that it's written right. in the story that it's telling. So the, the beauty of it is you didn't have to add to it. You, you just had to be there. <laughs> well, if I may also, I really think that is not to, to quote my own character, but it is also a testament to Inger and to the rest of our incredible cast because the way they handled the story and the way they handled the truth was just so beautifully in-depth. I, I, I could not have wished for a more incredible cast to tell the story with, truly. Here, no, here. I mean, in many ways, this feels like something that was, I would imagine, was found in sort of the rehearsal stage, if you had any, because <laughs> my question is, this is kind of unheard of to have a project with so many different writers, with so many different directors. I can't imagine there were 10 different voices on set. Like, was there was there sort of one guiding voice when you're in the moment and you, everything got worked out sort of beforehand? Because I can imagine... This didn't feel like something where you were going to improvise in the moment. Like if you were going to have a, a beat, you were going to have to try to figure that out beforehand. I think um, I think the beauty of what happened with this was because 
because the eight writers have been working together for a whole class year, more or less, um, they were of one voice. And then they interviewed the different directors. So they were also very aware of who they wanted, not only because of the skill set that they would bring or the vision that they would bring, but also, I think, just the idea that this person gets what the whole concept is, what the whole story is. So this became a huge like this project was the epitome of collaboration. Everyone had to be on the same page or like you said, it would have been a mess, you know, with eight writers, with 10 directors. And we were fortunate because most of the time what happened was whatever director, most directors had about 10 minutes each of the script. And so usually the director was just there for their piece. And there might be another director who was sort of being a second eye for them. But for the most part, you really only had that one guiding voice when you were doing whatever the particular scene was, with the exception of one or two people who were there for throughout the project to sort of have an idea of everything that had gone on, especially if they had something that was in the storyline that was later so they could figure out, you know, what has been happening before I got here. Um, but it was definitely a huge uh, bit of collaboration. And I think Jewel may have had the one day with the most directors. I think the most I had in one day was three, but I think he had a day with more than that. Yeah, so uh, we were lucky enough to be able, all the outdoor scenes of the of the film were shot at the Warner Brothers back lot. Uh, side note, talk about being on my first film and being on the Warner Brothers back lot was just surreal. Uh, the last scene in the movie is where the infamous Spider-Man upside down kiss happens. Oh, right, right, right. And we as a production were very limited when it came to when all of our outdoor scenes were shot during this time frame, and we had to get them all in during this time. And I think there was, when you have multiple directors, I think if you, if we are shooting our first scene and it takes a little bit longer, normally like a director can go, okay, I can make it more up on the back end, I can adjust it here. But with six different, I think, the most I ever had was six different directors in one day. And the hard thing is it becomes a domino effect. And so you lose more and more time for the scenes that follow. And the point being is that if we did not have that collaborative spirit, it wouldn't have been possible. We wouldn't have gotten the shots that we did, but because everybody knew what the beast was, as we lost the time, every just everybody just got even more focused and, and we did it. I think my last day on the Warner Brothers bat plot was at 4 a.m. And it, and it wasn't even the, that wasn't even, I wasn't even the last person to work that day. Like all the crew still had to break everything down and clean up and, and take things away from the back lot. So I just am so grateful for them, for them also taking on that. Now, I mean, this feels like one of those projects that just even on paper, it's like, this will never happen again. And I mean, I'm kind of curious when, like, when you read it, like when you're going out for parts and reading parts, is that one of the things that sort of draws you into something? Like, because obviously there's going to be character strength and material, but I mean, if there's an opportunity to do something that, okay, this will never come around again. Is that something that draws you into a project? Yes, <laughs> it is. And also, I, I think the idea of telling a story that you know the majority of people have never heard of before mm. that happened um that's seminal to to theater and and black theater like um and jewel has mentioned this before that orson often talked about feeling like this was the most successful thing he had ever done to be able to tell a story that you know no one knows of. And I lived in New York and did theater in New York and I had never heard of Rose McClendon. I mean, it was just, it, that was what made it exciting. Thinking that you might be the first person to, to give this story to the world and uh, to a community that might know about it in part, but maybe has never heard the full story. And hopefully something like this makes people, you know, go to Wikipedia and go to the sure. library and find out a little bit more about all the things that happened. Our film very much reflects the experience of the stage production in that way that there will never be another production like that original Voodoo Macbeth and what it accomplished and the fire that it struck in the people that saw it to the point where it still resonates to this day. And our experience with this film reflects that. 
And I think that's the beauty about art is that it's not meant to be recreated. Every single instance, every film, every play production is unique in that moment in time. And I think if you approach every opportunity with that kind of reverence and respect and, and gratitude, every opportunity has the potential to reflect that. But I do agree with you that this one is much more special and unique because it reflects and is connected to that event in a very similar manner. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I mean, just to put a bow on this, I mean, Jewel, we'll start with you. It's a dumb question, but it's one I always like to ask. No dumb questions. No, no such thing. Can you think back to the younger days? Was there a, a moment in your life where you saw a, a play, a film, a TV show, a piece of work, something that had the light bulb go off in your head and made you want to go, you know what? I want to do this. I want to get into this business. Yeah, I, I actually remember where it was. I, I grew up a big music theater nerd. I think my, I discovered my parents' recording album of Ben of the Opera when I was very a little. But because I showed an interest, my parents took me to see a production of Ragtime, oh, which wow. deals with very similar themes happening out in a particular point in history. And watching this musical was the first time that I realized that art wasn't just entertaining, that it didn't have to just be like, fluff or or exciting or thrilling it could be moving and it could tell it could reflect a moment in history it could evoke truth and a lot of people don't think of musical theater that way but that was my first experience and i that was my first time i realized that art could really go far deeper as a kid it was the first time i was in seats and i was like oh my gosh i get this I understand what they're talking about. I understand how it connects to our history in my place in the world and our connected tissue to all of these challenging sticky things in a, our humanity that have played out in our country. So that was my first experience with that. Love it. Inger, how about you? Um, I, I don't know that I have a first experience because as my family tells it, I've always been an actor even when I was a little kid and was always doing something. But I do remember I used to, I was a lawyer at one point in time. And at the point when I decided to give up practicing law, I remember a good friend of mine from college sort of got into an argument with me because they're like, you know, you're a black woman and you're a lawyer. There are so many amazing things you can do. And I remember, which struck me as odd because we knew each other because we had both acted in college. And I said to him, Yes, but the beauty of art, the beauty of acting is if you do a play where you're playing Marie, Marie Curie and a little girl decides that she wants to be a scientist, if you're doing a production about a dysfunctional family and it makes someone go home and pick up the phone and call their father that they've been estranged with for, you know, and they haven't talked to in a year, that's much more effective the most of what I would be able to do as a corporate lawyer. Mm. So for me, that was the, like realizing that I could do more for the human spirit as an actor than as a lawyer was sort of the big thing for me. Well, I, I love that. I mean, thank you both for doing more for the human spirit because I mean, in watching this, it was such a reminder of how dynamic the art of storytelling really can be and i mean i think you guys have done this with with this film and then some it's a great piece of work and just inger jewel thank you so much for the time today oh my gosh thank, thank you. you for having us yeah and again congrats i can't wait for people to see this it's so it's such a good film us too can i wait <laughs> yes especially we started shooting this before the pandemic so right. it, it's just been so thrilling to be able to see people experience it so please go watch the film and again, can't wait. for sure that which again at the end of the day is why you're in this business to begin with no for sure but again thank you both for the time this was a lot of fun thank, thank you, you. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and blu-ray needs <laughs>